When we feel depressed, we occupy certain postures, we feel it in our gut, we feel it in our limbs, we can feel fatigue, we can feel anxious. And so the emotions are really where you capture that mind, the brain body contract and relationship very intensely. Okay. Major depression impacts 5% of the population. That is an enormous number. That means if you're in a class of 100 people, five of them are dealing with major depression or have at some point. Look around you in any environment and you can be sure that a good portion of the people that you're surrounded by is impacted by depression or will be at some point. So this is something we really have to take seriously and that we want to understand. It is the number four cause of disability. A lot of people miss work, miss school, and before then likely perform poorly in work or school due to major depression. In order to determine if somebody has depression or not, we have to use language, how they talk about things, also how they carry their body, also some general patterns of health. So let's talk about depression the way that clinicians talk about depression. Because one of the issues is that we use the word depression loosely. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm so depressed. I didn't get this job or I'm so depressed. I just, I don't know, I had a really rough week or I'm exhausted. I'm so depressed or I'm so depressed. I thought I was going to go on vacation and then they canceled the flight. Okay. That is not clinical depression. That's called being bummed out, being sad or disappointed. Now that person might be depressed, but clinical depression actually has some very specific criteria. And those criteria are mainly characterized by the presence of certain things and the absence of a few particular things. So let's talk about the things that are present in somebody that has major depression. First of all, there tends to be a lot of grief. There tends to be a lot of sadness. That's no surprise. The threshold to cry is often a signature of depression. Now, that doesn't mean that if you cry easily that you're depressed. Some people cry more easily than others. But if you're somebody who typically didn't cry easily and suddenly you find yourself crying very easily, that could be a sign of depression. And I want to emphasize could. There's also this thing that we call anhedonia, a general lack of ability to enjoy things. Things that typically or previously we enjoyed. Things like food, things like sex, things like exercise, things like social gatherings. A kind of lack of enjoyment from those things. Sometimes that lack of enjoyment is sad and sometimes it's just flat. It's just kind of neutral. It doesn't feel good because there's nothing there. It's like bland food. It's like the, these experiences are analogous to biting into your favorite article of food and it just not tasting very good. It just doesn't taste like anything at all. And that's a common symptom of major depression. The other one is guilt. Oftentimes people with depression will feel very guilty about things they have done in the past or they'll just generally feel badly about themselves. And we're going to talk about this because it relates to some of the more serious symptomology seen in depression sometimes, things like self-harm, mutilation, or even suicide. But for the time being, we want to frame up anhedonia, this lack of ability to achieve or experience pleasure, a kind of a flat affect as it's called. Sometimes even delusional thinking, negative delusional thinking, and in particular, anti-self confabulation. What is anti-self confabulation? Well, first of all, confabulation is an incredible aspect of our mind and our nervous system. You sometimes see other forms of confabulation in people who have memory deficits, either because they have brain damage or they have age-related dementia. A good example of this would be someone with age-related dementia sometimes will find themselves in a location in the house and not know how they got there. And if you ask them, oh, what are you doing here? They will create these elaborate stories. Oh, you know, I was thinking about going to the shopping today and I was, um, you know, and I was gonna take the bus and then I was gonna do, they create these elaborate stories, they confabulate. And yet that person hasn't left the house in weeks and that person doesn't have a driver's license. And so they're really just creating this stuff. They're not lying to get out of anything. They're confabulating. It's as if a brain circuit that writes stories just starts generating content. In major depression, there's often a state of delusional anti-self confabulation where the confabulations are not directly or completely linked to reality, but they are ones that make the self, the person describing them, seem sick or in some way not well. A good example would be somebody who experiences a physical injury, perhaps. Maybe they break their ankle, maybe it's an athlete, and they also happen to become depressed. And you'll talk to them, you say, how are things going? How's your rehab? And they'll go, oh, it's okay. And I don't know, I'm just, I feel like I'm getting weaker and weaker by the day. I'm just not performing well. And then you'll talk to the person that they're working with 
their kinesiologist or whoever the, the physical therapist is. And they'll say, no, they're actually really improving. And I tell them they're improving, but somehow they're not. They're not seeing that improvement. They're not registering that improvement. And you notice that sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's severe, but they'll start confabulating. You'll say, I actually heard you're doing much better. You're, you're getting better. You're taking multiple trips around the building now before you could barely get out of bed. And they'll say, yeah, well, basically, you know, they changed some things about the um, about the parking lot that make it easier to move around. So it's not really me. And these aren't people that are just explaining away their, uh, you know, their accomplishments because they're they're trying to, you know, brush off praise. They are viewing themselves and they are confabulating according to a view that is very self-deprecating to the point where it doesn't match up with reality. It's not what other people see, and it's actually not matched up with reality. And that's a symptom of depression that I think we don't often think about or conceptualize enough. So it's not just telling people, oh yeah, you know, it's not as good as it seems, everything's bad. These people really believe that, and it becomes disconnected from reality. Emotions are a real thing, and they certainly, perhaps more than anything else, recruit the brain and the body. When we feel depressed, we occupy certain postures, we feel it in our gut, we feel it in our limbs, we can feel fatigue, we can feel anxious. And so the emotions are really where you capture that mind, the brain body contract and relationship very, very intensely. Okay. I think with the current technology, we can understand states. And from there, I do believe that we can make a significant dent into certain mental health issues mm. and optimize performance in certain, you know, communities that are trying to optimize performance yeah. and in the general public. But the, th- the states that we're focused on are very concrete. For instance, alert and focused. I mean, there are really two forms of depression. Um, sometimes they're intermixed, but one is anxiety associated depression. And you, you, if you've ever experienced it or for anyone that's experienced it, that they feel agitation in their body and their mind races, but in their body. So the body is recruited. There are also depressive states that people feel very fatigued and exhausted, it's an overwhelm. And they also experience that in their body. The, the idea of getting out of bed in the morning is hard, um, motivating to exercise, doing the sorts of things that we know are powerful for pushing back on depression. Mm-hmm. So the body is recruited. I think most people would say that depressive states are bad when they bring down the baseline on life. I, just to, as a brief aside, anytime there's a question about mental health or addiction or trauma, or anything, one could look at it and make up some argument of, well, evolutionarily, this makes sense, we all get depressed, but we have to be fair to the person experiencing it, of course, and have sensitivity that some behaviors will keep the baseline of our life steady, meaning job, relationships, et cetera, will continue as they are. Other activities will tend to improve the baseline on our life, job, activities, relationship, et cetera, will, will improve. And then there's some things like heroin, which does very quickly, we can predict that very quickly the baseline on life is going to creep down regardless of who that person is, mm-hmm. right? So people say, can you get addicted to water? Well, maybe, but I have to drink a lot of water before the baseline on my life starts to go down. Right. So we tend to throw around things like addiction and depression a little loosely. So yeah. I, I think that it's fair to say that depression is wired into us as a possible state that we could all fall into, but that it's very important in my opinion that humans have tools to remove themselves from that state, of course, to avoid you know, tragedies like suicide, but also because when the baseline on someone's life goes down far enough, they find it increasingly hard to do the sorts of things that are gonna get them out of depression. And eventually, because of this very um, inseparable relationship between the brain and body, eventually what happens is that because the brain controls the body, but also the body can control the brain, Mm. people lose the ability to intervene in this depressive process. So you or I could say, look, if someone who's depressed, they, what they need to do is get up early, get some light in their eyes, um, get some movement. I know you put this information out there, which I love because these, those tips are grounded in, they're not even tips, they're really tools. And they're very powerful because they're grounded in excellent science. If you get into a very cold shower, you take an ice bath, you will release norepinephrine and epinephrine in your brain and body. There's no question about that. I don't think anyone can really escape that. It's a kind of a universal response to being in cold water. Well, if some aspects of depression are related to low levels of norepinephrine, will taking cold showers relieve your depression? Perhaps it might even relieve certain aspects of that depression. Is it a cure? Well, that's going to depend on the individual. Will exercise help? Well, if you go out for a run, you're going to increase the amount of norepinephrine in your body. 
if you enjoy that run, it's likely that you'll increase the levels of dopamine and probably serotonin in your brain and body as well. Will that cure your depression? Well, there are a lot of studies exploring how exercise can impact depression. And indeed, regular exercise is known to be a protective behavior against depression, but it also can help relieve some of the symptoms of depression. So you may ask yourself, why would you need drugs at all? Why would there be prescription drugs or the need for supplementation or other things to alleviate the symptoms of depression? Ah, well, that's the diabolical nature of depression, which is if people are far enough along in this thing, this sometimes called disease, sometimes called disorder, but major depression, oftentimes they can't get the energy to even get up and take a bath or a shower. They have no motivation to do it. They have no desire to go for a run. So you say, come on, let's go. You'll feel better. I know you'll feel better. It generates all these chemicals. I heard on the whatever podcast, Huberman Lab podcast or another podcast that getting into action does all these things. And they just don't want to do it. And to you, a person who's not experiencing depression, that perhaps could just seem like the most frustrating and confusing thing in the world. But it's very important to highlight the fact that these circuits that are accessible to some of us, the circuits for happiness, for pursuit of pleasure, for exercise, for getting in a cold shower, if that's your thing, those circuits are present in all people. But for certain people that are experiencing major depression and are really in the depths of their their depression, they can't really access those circuits in the same way that people who are not suffering from depression can. I hope that makes it clear. It's not offering any excuses for them. And indeed, I think those behaviors would help jolt them out of some of the symptomology of depression, but they're just not accessible to everybody.